Okay, so yesterday, uh, so we want to continue on from where we left off yesterday. So the idea today is, uh, we're going to talk about a few infrastructure sectors, build up a vocabulary. We'll talk a little bit about what India is doing in infrastructure as a whole. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about a couple of sectors. Ideally, uh, you know, on tap for today are uh, transportation, power and telecom. Uh, we'll see if we can get through all three, great. Otherwise, we'll shift, uh, you know, we'll sort of just have whatever we haven't discussed in the next session. Uh, you'll recall we talked about this yesterday. We said uh, this uh, here is a measure of, oops is a measure of a country's infrastructure. Uh, the x-axis, which in this case is paved roads per capita, right? So countries with better infrastructure have more paved roads per capita or per million inhabitants. Countries with poorer infrastructure have less paved roads per capita. And this is a measure of a country's wealth, right? And what we said is there's a really nice correlation happening here. Uh, things are along the diagonal. And so infrastructure and uh, economic growth are correlated. We don't know the direction of correlation. Perhaps richer countries have more money to spend on infra or perhaps countries that spend on infra become richer. We're not quite sure, but we know that they're linked. So any, in any case, if the end goal is India should become a developed country, clearly at some point our infrastructure needs to step up, right? We also, I mentioned briefly, but I also want to touch upon the fact that infrastructure essentially does two things, right? Infrastructure promotes economic growth. Um, right, which is what we saw in the previous graph. But side by side, it also helps with more equitable source, uh, you know, societal outcomes, right? So you can take any of these examples. You can take transportation, right? So if you have better transportation infrastructure, are you likely to have more economic growth, right? And the answer is probably yes, right? You're likely to have more economic growth because, you know, essentially you sell more, right? You might essentially be selling more uh, produce faster. Right? So now I have transportation networks, I can manufacture something in Chennai, I can manufacture a car in Chennai and I can sell it anywhere in India so I can cater to demand. Uh, earlier I might have had to geographically bind myself and say no, no, I can only supply to this area but because I have wonderful transportation networks, uh, I can actually achieve large scale economic growth. Right? But at the same time, uh, as we briefly mentioned yesterday, if you're a farmer right, and you're relying on transportation networks to get your produce to the market, if those transportation networks are bad, and it takes a long time for your produce to get to the market, then the chances of things spoiling and rotting in the process is higher. And therefore, the amount of money that you might earn right, is going to be lower. If I had really good transportation networks and all of my produce is able to get to market, uh, then it stands to reason that I would actually make money on everything I grow. Right? And therefore, also, not only am I making more money from an economic growth uh, perspective, right, I also you know, achieve a poverty reduction kind of uh, you know, perspective, right? In terms of I'm, I'm able to generate wealth equitably or not only to high uh, ends of society. Some of those arguments are more, uh, you know, stark in water and sanitation, right? So we look at water and sanitation. We talked about this yesterday. Uh, a lot of diseases are waterborne diseases, right? So you and I fall ill by drinking uh, poor quality water. Worst case, in your case, you're going to miss a couple of classes, not the end of the world, right? In my case, I'm going to miss a couple of days of work. I've got enough leave. It's not the end of the world. But if you're a daily laborer, right? if you're a daily wage earner, every day of work missed is income lost. Right? And it isn't as if you have a huge savings balance that you fall upon. Right? So by providing better quality water supply, right, where I give you more portable water, less uh, you know, waterborne disease infected water, etc., if I can keep you healthy longer, Right? That means you're going to go for work, uh, go to work for a larger number of days in a year, which means not only are you going to earn more, it's a bit of a double whammy because you're actually spending less on medical fees, right? which is where a lot of the money goes. Right? So you have, again, the, the providing good quality water and sanitation uh, infrastructure, you have also the impact of uh, poverty reduction. Right? Telecommunications perhaps is more on the economic growth side. We're able to do business. Uh, much faster energy. So uh, I'm not going to get into these now because we'll get into each of these sectors and we'll unpack them a little bit. But what I want, what, what I want us all to think about is everyone talks about infrastructure and GDP, right? And that was what we had on the previous slide. Okay, uh, you'll always find these predictions. India needs to grow at 10%. India's GDP needs to grow at 10% because of which need to invest in infrastructure. That's all of that is fine. But we also have to understand that infrastructure is something that touches everyone's lives, and therefore it is also a way in which you reduce poverty, uh, provide equitable access to services, and generally make people's lives much better. Right? So infrastructure fulfills these dual purposes, which is why, recall what we talked about yesterday or in the last class, we want to talk about, we want to consider infrastructure not just as an asset, but as a service. 
right? It's providing a service to people. And uh, yeah, uh, but world over, uh, although a few of you disagreed yesterday, but by and large, uh, people sort of agree that world over and in India in particular, we have some kind of an infrastructure crisis, right? In developed countries, and this includes countries like the United States, for instance, right? The United States built a lot of its infrastructure roads, for instance, uh, you know, right after World War II. That was the way in which they were trying to stimulate the economy after the war. They went in for a massive road building program. Wonderful highways, but those highways are now, what, 70, 80 years old. Right? So a lot of that infrastructure is starting to show signs of wear and tear. Right? It isn't functioning as well as it is even in developed countries. Right? Uh, in developing countries, uh, some of that infrastructure is simply not there. Right? We are still talking about needing to connect 100% of Indian citizens with basic sanitation facilities, etc., which are not there. And these are the kinds of problems that you find. Right? Lots of, uh, you know, even in urban settings, right? you have places where there is no water. Um, right, where people are having to rely on, rely on water tankers that are highly expensive, uh, not very regular, uh, right, no power. Yesterday when we started off class, there was no power, um, right, so that's a, a relatively common occurrence and it doesn't have to be only in rural areas, um, right. Uh, roads, lots of potholes, uh, lots of wear and tear on several, uh, several roads, too much traffic, which again causes all kinds of congestion related issues and all of that. And so the point is that it's, it's of course all not, it's not all doom and gloom, right? So these days there are, there are, you know, wonderful roads available in all parts of the country. We have, and we'll talk about it now, we've gone through a national highways development program and we've started laying roads, right? Uh, clearly our energy infrastructure is far more robust today. We are generating far more energy now than we did earlier. And now that some of that energy is coming from alternative sources like solar. We've gotten much better at managing that energy and not losing a lot of it, right? So it's not all doom and gloom. But the fact of the matter is, when you step outside, you're hit with congestion, you're hit with poor quality water, you're hit with power cuts, all of that. And the question is, why can't we eliminate all of this, right? Because if we do, according to what we've seen, the country will grow faster and people will be a lot happier, right? So this is essentially what we want to talk about, all right? So let's start getting into infrastructure sectors. All right. So we'll talk about transportation, power, telecom, but just before that, right? So then we'll, this is what we'll do. We'll sort of look at, uh, is there a need for infrastructure in these, uh, in these sectors in India or have we built what we need to build? Uh, what are the kinds of schemes, projects, etc., that we're doing now? And what are the, the key learnings? What are the performances? What's happening today, right? Just get a sense of what's uh, out there. This can't be comprehensive. You guys can spend hours browsing through various government websites and gathering more information. This is meant to be a little bit indicative, all right? But first, in your perception, what is India doing? With regards to infrastructure, what have you heard about? What are we doing? Infrastructure in general to start with. Yeah, so we're trying to expand infrastructure. What ways, what are we doing? Give me some specific examples. Okay, so some people saying smart cities. Okay, right, good, smart cities. Ah, so government schemes, what kind of government schemes? Okay, so there are electrification schemes, uh, PMGSY. For those of you who don't know what PMGSY is, it's the pra Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana. As the name implies, Gram Sadak, so it's more of the rural road uh, kind of uh, scheme, right? All right, uh, somebody said Swachh Bharat, I'll put that in as well because uh, that relates, relates to waste and waste management, which is part of infrastructure. National corridors, all right. National, sorry, corridors. Uh, Bharat Mala, we'll talk about these in a second. Uh, mass housing, you guys are saying a lot of things. I may not capture everything. Uh, mass housing, what do we, uh, what, what is that called? Right, so there is the uh, Avaz Yojana. Um, so there is, it used to be called the Rajiv Avaz Yojana. Now I think it's called the, the Pradhan Mantri Avaz Yojana. Correct, the Pradhan Mantri Avaz Yojana. Uh, there's also a scheme. Okay, I have a few of these. So we are doing, we are essentially creating a number of schemes. What do these schemes do? Right, somebody makes an announcement. Pradhan Mantri Avaz Yojana, Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana, Smart Cities. Right, what do these things do? So what is a smart city uh, program or smart city mission as we call it, what does it do? Yeah. That's the idea. So the smart city, the idea behind smart cities is I want better planned cities, I want cities of tomorrow. But what does it do? How do we get there? Right? So these are all initiatives that the government has come up with 
and each initiative has a, has a vision. So Pradhan Mantri Avaz Yojana says everyone needs to have a house. Right, uh, Gram Sadak Yojana says every village needs to be connected. Smart City said, says all cities need to be cities of the future. So we say all of this, right? But what is, but beyond saying this, what does the scheme or the mission do? They quantify goals, but all right, all that's academic, right? So I can quantify goals and say, okay, but what, what else? They provide employment to the people. Does the, do these schemes provide employment to people? So very, very directly, what is, why are these schemes so appealing? All right, so there are a couple of things, right, that you guys have said just now, which, which I think are critical. One is these schemes provide funding. Right. One of the key things that most of these schemes do is they provide funding. So smart cities, number of cities have been selected and these cities are given a certain amount of money. We will talk about it when we get into the urban infrastructure sector in detail. Um, right. And also a framework is established in terms of what you can do and what you should do. Right. So smart cities, if you go in and you can, you can see a list of critical things that uh, the cities must do and then beyond that there are uh, things that they can do depending on their bandwidth financing available etc. So essentially we are trying to do two things right. Essentially one is we are trying to increase funding on infrastructure. Pradhan Mantri Avaz Yojana, we didn't, uh, you guys didn't mention something called Amrut which is there, it's called the Atal Mission for Rejuvenation and Urban Transport, uh, Urban Transformation which in some ways is a, uh, the second uh, you know, level implementation of something that we used to call the Jawaharlal Nehru National Urban Re Renewal Mission, right? So we had JN and URM for a series of years, uh, which provided funding for cities to upgrade their urban infrastructure. And now Amrut does something quite similar, right? Uh, smart cities, National Highway Development Program, Bharat Mala is part of the National Highway Development Program. So this, and there are many others. I have not listed these comprehensively. It's funding is provided. In addition to funding, certain kinds of frameworks are provided, some directives are provided and some, uh, you know, some other sort of perks or incentives are provided, right. So we are trying to sort of decentralize, okay, to say, look, can various agencies, have, so smart cities, right, the Ministry of Urban Development is actually doing relatively little. We are trying to strengthen the cities and say, look, I will give you guys money, you decide. Right, what uh, and how to build your smart city, right? Uh, trying to improve transparency, inclusivity, encouraging private sector participation. So, we're trying to provide some guidelines, right, so that different players at different parts of the country can take this money and actually build better infrastructure, right? So, what the government of India is trying to do is actually set the rules of the game, right? Set the rules of the game, give some funding and uh, let various organizations could be national highways could be corporation of chennai could be you know the uh, uh, public works department right who can then leverage and build infrastructure all right one of the things that we'll come come to repeatedly in this class is this right the private sector participation right psp some people call it ppp public private partnerships etc and it's worth i think spending a minute although we'll we'll discuss this in detail in the class i think it's worth spending a minute just historically looking at uh, the infrastructure story in India and, and why this is relevant, right? So clearly pre-independence, a lot of the infrastructure was built by the British, all right? There is a big debate. Some people say, oh, the British built really good quality infrastructure. Look at some of the drainage systems they built, etc. Uh, if you're interested, I will uh, refer you to Shashi Tharoor's latest book, Era of Darkness, which if you've read, it's actually, he writes really well. Uh, but he makes the claim that yes, the British did build good infrastructure, but the cost to India of that infrastructure was extraordinarily high. So yes, they did build a, a railway system that we, that we leverage now. They did build, you know, um, urban sanitation networks that function, some of which function even today. But the cost at which they built it and the amount of money that went out of India for that was far, far higher than had we built it ourselves, right? Um, so, but it was still funded, you know, by the British. And then after independence, we went through, uh, you know, a period where we decided to nationalize a lot of what we were doing, right? Uh, so the government essentially took control of a lot of the infrastructure development functions post-independence. Uh, this was again uh, on account of a number of reasons. Again, some really good books to read on this are Ramachandra Guha's uh, India, uh, India After Gandhi, right? So a wonderful sort of book that traces what happened to India from 1947 till the early 2000s. And he makes the argument that in 1947, when if you were in India at the time and you looked around, you've just come out of independence. All right. The world is in shambles, right? Because World War II has just sort of finished. One of the reasons why the British moved away when they did was also because they were impoverished, couldn't really run India, 
from uh, you know after in the aftermath of world war 2 so most of these so called developed countries are in terrible shape uh, in india of course we are also in very poor shape we are a poor country we've just received independence and there's a need to strategically think about how we go ahead and build the country going forward and essentially there are roughly two options one is to say let's get strong government support and let government build the other option is to say let's start getting the private industry involved and let them build right when you look at the private industry option in 1947 it looks like a pretty poor option for two reasons one is when you look across the world everyone's in trouble right no one's jumping to come to your aid all right but secondly uh, the last time you let a private enterprise in right was in whatever 16 50 odd when the east india company came in and we know what happened for the next 350 80 odd years right and so again mentally you want to think twice about really giving control to the private sector so because of these reasons uh, essentially there was a decision that was taken to centralize a lot of the infrastructure production functions and if you read ramchandra guha's book he talks about how the leading industrialists of the day made a representation to nehru prime minister at the time saying you should take over the infrastructure and and a lot of the you know sort of regulatory functions uh, in india at the time and so while later on people come and say oh we were we had this uh, sarkari raj license raj this that and all of that it's important to note that at the time even the top indian industrialist went ahead with that view and said we we want you guys to take the responsibility as government so government took responsibility had a series of five year plans which you probably if familiar with through the planning commission uh, which was alive until relatively recently and started building uh now for a variety of reasons we entered into again what has been termed this license raj kind of mentality where in order to do something you would essentially have to procure a license from government right and so as somebody uh, you know once put it and i try to get this right uh you sold what you made you didn't necessarily make what you could sell right so the point is if you have a license to uh manufacture car tires right then you can manufacture car tires the way you want right in whatever shape and people would have to buy them because there are no alternative car manufacturers car tire manufacturers right because that's the whole point of licensing there aren't there isn't that much competition in the economy right so essentially you sold what you made rather than the other way around where you would say oh these guys are making these kinds of tires with these kinds of materials i need to sort of compete with them otherwise people will not buy my tires right so that kind of a uh, so you had that kind of a system um and you had what some people and so our economy grew at a rate of about 2% which is relatively low and uh, in some circles it was also called the hindu rate of growth right so people used to refer to that as the hindu rate of growth and essentially said look country like india that's all you can grow at at 2% right so this continued essentially up till 1991 uh, at a time when uh, manmohan singh at the time was the finance minister and then we had a a pretty bad economic crisis we actually had to default Uh, on some loans and and that sort of brought things to a to a head where we said look the economy can't really move on so at that point we did something right i don't know do you guys i don't know if you guys know what this something is called right so we did something called liberalization right exactly okay what is liberalization so in, in very simple terms that's what it is right liberalize essentially says okay it's not just foreign right it just says open up these kinds of markets right let other people come in and provide let there be competition for uh, you know all kinds of services cars for instance right so you can have a number of car manufacturers come in and let them compete and citizens will then choose uh, you know which car they like best and that will incentivize people to innovate incentivize people to drop costs let's start getting more to into the market economy uh you know kind of mode of thinking like right? so liberalization was the first step towards uh, towards that but what that did in relevance to this is when you extend that argument the argument was okay fine car manufacturing can be opened up etc uh but what about infrastructure right and at some point people at some fundamental level people said look infrastructure is basic it, it needs to be provided by government right but if you carry the liberalization logic forward people started asking the question why can't infrastructure be open to private players as well right because at the end of the day it's a service right so why can't we have a number of people delivering that service and we as citizens pick uh, the best person right and vote with our feet and so private sector participation is something that arose as a result of liberalization which i think is a key watershed moment in india's in uh, history in india's history in general but of course the history in infrastructure as well right and we'll see ramifications of that today uh, in days past and uh, in days in the future as we go through this class right so essentially that's what india is doing we've liberalized part of liberalizing is we've allowed competition in 
which hopefully helps more people come in and start making our infrastructure better, competing with each other. But we've also done a few things. We've started creating these kinds of schemes and we've started creating policies around these schemes that we hope will help improve infrastructure development. You know, encouraging private participation is one such policy, right, that we've sort of created. So this is what the government of India is doing. This is across sectors. Right? It isn't as if we're only funding one sector allowing PPPs and one, we're doing it across sectors. Right? So far so good?